Hi, uh, my name is Saman. I'm one of the co-presidents of the Osler Society, and this is the Osler Essay Competition Information Session uh, featuring Professor Roland de Maestro and Pam and uh, Dr. A. Girl, uh, the Osler librarian. So the hope of the session is to give you a sense about uh, what the essay competition is like. We have some of the previous winners of the essay competition also joining us shortly. And so if you have any questions about this, want to talk with your friends, it's a really great experience. So, so we have a a relatively condensed but uh, informative session going on and uh, we're great to see you. Good, so maybe we can wait a couple more minutes because it would be nice to see if some of the people who have, um, you know, uh, Saman was one of the winners of the uh, essay contest, so he'll be able to provide some uh, information. Uh, Lily uh, Grossman, who also was one of the winners and along with Brendan uh, Ross, who another one is another one of the winners, um, mentioned that they may be able to get on get on the um, this particular zoom call so I think we can uh, we'll wait a few seconds for that but maybe what we can do is um, I can start off a little bit and then Pam can can add a few words here too <laughs> related to it my wife and I um, felt a number of years ago that um, it would be useful for um, medical students and pre-medical students to who have an interest in the humanities uh, to have a, um, a framework by which they would be able to be uh, uh, able to carry out various types of research. Uh, associated with this, there is a, what is, there's an American OSER Society, which is uh, an OSER Society that's really global. There's individuals on that OSER Society from pretty well everywhere in the world, Australia and everywhere else, who are interested in some of the humanistic aspects of medicine. And uh, so attempting to link the two ideas, both the idea that uh, it's important to sort of expand one's knowledge of the human humanities and medicine and how humanities can help you with your, with your practice and with your ability to understand what medicine is really about. And the uh, linkages with the American OSHA Society has allowed, for example, um, the winners uh, and many of the individuals who uh, are second and third prize, et cetera, uh, to um, be able to attend the American Ulster Society meetings. Uh, this year's meeting was in Galveston. The last two before that, because of COVID, happened to be, um, happened to be <clears throat> on Zoom, but this year's meeting was in Galveston. Uh, next year's meeting will be in London, England, and the meeting after that is in Kansas City. So. Uh, there is, um, and the meeting in 2019, which was associated with uh, uh, 100 years since the opening of the Ulster Library of the History of Medicine was in Montreal. So there's a, there's a, a large community of, of individuals who were interested more in the human, humanistic situation. Uh, Ulster's name is, is used, I think, more as a, um, not so much as a model, but at least it's some type of a symbol of an individual who was, uh, who along with having uh, been one of the leaders in medicine of the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. Uh, and so that involvement and also the involvement he had with, with the, the humanities uh, just I think provides some type of a, a model that, that other people can sort of think about as one way to, to deal with medicine and uh, the areas of medicine that are involved. Um, so what basically occurred is um, that uh, this particular um, uh, essay contest is, uh, is endowed, which means that there are prizes for the first, second, and third uh, position. Um, Mary will be able to talk to you a little bit more about both the process by which this all occurs. Uh, but I think in essence, um, this sort of essay contest allows you to basically explore almost anything that you think is reasonable uh, and that you would like to, to further explore. Uh, for example, Brendan, um, the Brendan uh, was uh, involved in uh, assessing a uh, Japanese scroll that was associated with an autopsy that was done in the 17th century. And so that's one aspect. There are, there are a number of resources in the uh, Ulster Library uh, that are open 
to uh, to you to uh, explore. Uh, and Mary can talk a bit more about that. Uh, other winners, for example, have looked at such things as uh, the first sort of uh, birth control booklet that was produced at a university that happened to be at uh, happened to be at uh, McGill. Uh, other other individuals, uh, Saman, for example, talked about uh, Schumann and, and his bipolar disorder. Uh, Lily Thompson, uh, Dilly Glossman uh, discussed some of the other issues associated with some of the problems that occurred in the 1930s associated with uh, uh, Jewish concerns and uh, problems with uh, bigotry that uh, was, was rampant at that time. So it's, it's really an ability to sort of, if you can think about something that is of interest to you, uh, then there is the ability to sort of look into that and, um, and help to um, sort of deal with that. I see that uh, Lily has just come on, so. Hi. Hi Lily, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm very well, I'm very well. So always saying, I was just mentioning Lily that uh, that you had uh, that you and uh, Saman and uh, Brendan had been at um, have been at uh, the American Ulster meeting in Galveston and, and presented um, uh, at that time, and uh, just mentioning the the resources that are available for for individuals who are interested in uh, in in looking into something sort of a little bit different uh, on the humanity side. I think looking back, if I'd have had the ability to do this when I was uh, a medical student, I think I would have been more than interested in doing it just because it just gives you, just gives you other opportunities that you, you don't know so necessarily have um, to do other things besides just, just aspects of medicine. So maybe I can stop it there. And uh, so man, I think what we can do maybe is, is go on to an, uh, some of the other components and then then uh, people can uh, give their uh, impressions and then uh, we can ask, answer all kinds of questions. No, absolutely. I think that because also Lily's here, maybe I can also elaborate a little bit more about the process of this. I'll share my experience uh, as first a participant and then also about the mission of the Ulster Society and then Lily can also tune in and share her insights. I think Brendan will be joining us soon too. So the basic idea behind the Hammond Roland Digital Maestro essay competition is to utilize the resources that are available at the Osler Library, which is actually back at the Osler uh, Library uh, with a lot of great efforts. So uh, this is something that uh, students can participate in. Uh, it's a very unique uh, event too, because uh, from my knowledge, this is the only place in the country that has this sort of feature. And uh, the idea is that you would send a proposal uh, to uh, Dr. A. Girl and uh, you know, you would we also be able to get uh, suggestions and mentorship for pe previous past winners. Uh, the link to the, uh, the essay competition, which I'll try to find shortly and put in the chat so other people can also use it as a reference, highlights some of the different projects that have been done. So if you need some ideas about things, you can certainly refer to those. I'll say from my own experience, when I was doing this in my first year, I was interested in something music related and I didn't find a topic and I initially thought, well, would I still want to do this if I haven't seen it? So it worked out very nicely. And I really do believe that if you do a topic that you enjoy participating in, uh, you, you gain a lot more from it. And I think the big benefit of this essay competition isn't that you just write the essay, you also get the chance to be mentored by a faculty member in their respective field. Now, in the social studies of medicine, there are quite a number of experts that are very well versed in different aspects of the humanities of medicine. Uh, but that is not, again, only the option available. As I said, I work with the faculty in the Department of Music, Professor Roman Cook, and um, this really turned out to be a great event and a great opportunity. Uh, I'm working on a book chapter now uh, with Cambridge University Press from this. So things can happen very serendipitously without you expecting it. And also, it's it's something that, especially with, I think, I see a fair bit of mid ones, uh, you have a very nice uh, stretch of time over the summer, and so this also extends to the next semester, so it's, it's really nice to sort of plan things out, uh, sort of explore different topics, and I hope that if some of the members here have questions at any point, you can more... Uh, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask them, and we'll be happy to address it, but it is a really great event. Uh, it's a place for you to write about something. It's a place for you to get mentorship. And it's also something that stays uh, with you forever. And the fact that there are prizes too makes it even better. And that really is part of the mission of the Ozer Society too, is to 
uh, interconnect or say different areas of medicine, with history, with intellectual pursuits. Uh, and, uh, and Lily had a wonderful presentation. And as Dr. Domeister also mentioned, uh, uh, the, the fact that you can also attend the American Ulster Society meeting is a, is a great plus. Uh, I did it in my second year. Brendan did it in his third year. Lily did it in her first year. So you'll hopefully also get a good sense of you know, how that can be possible depending on what year you're in. So that is another option too. And uh, it's something that I think you will really enjoy. You will learn by doing it and you will do by learning it. So it goes both ways. And, uh, those are some of the insights. Uh, I don't want to talk too much. I'm certainly happy to share more perspective about my project, but I certainly want to pass it on to Lily to share how the process of writing the essay was for her, what she learned, and even uh, what are some of her key takeaways. Well, thank you, Saman, for sharing. I basically, like, everything I was going to say was said by you, but the only thing that, that I would really add is that, um, well, first of all, I really want to reiter reiterate that, like, I really think it's important to choose a topic that you enjoy because it could seem daunting to write such a long, like it's not so long, but it's pr pretty long of an essay considering it's our summer break. But for me, it was really like, I didn't feel like I was doing work at all because I was really interested in the topic. So I think that it's really important to choose something that you're actually passionate about and that you wanna learn more about because it's going to shine in your paper and it's gonna show that like, your only your essay is going to be a lot better if you put your heart into it. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to add was that not like for me, my favorite part about being this year's essay winner is that I got to connect with so many people, not only like at the American Osler meeting in Texas, but also after the virtual the virtual presentation was posted on YouTube. So many people reached out to me and contacted me wanting to know more about my topic. And I connected to like a lot of McGill grads, a lot of family members and friends of the subject that I wrote about. So I think that like, for me, that was my favorite part about the essay contest. But if you guys have any questions about writing or need motivation to find a topic or get going, I'll be glad to help. I guess if anyone has any questions now. Well, maybe Mary, you can sort of add uh, your, uh, your input into the mechanism, how it sort of works. So everybody understands that aspect too. Sure, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so um, I certainly would repeat the idea that you want to work on something that's of, of interest to you and we can help you refine your topic as well. I mean, in fact, I. I would even encourage you, I think, if if you have a general area that you're hoping to work on, but don't necessarily know the specifics, it's OK even to maybe have a brainstorming conversation with us um, up, up front, because, you know, sometimes we'll get someone who decide who maybe chooses an area they're interested in and they do enough research that they say, I really want to work on this person. And it, it may or may not be. Um, um, you know, that specifically that we have something on, but sometimes we can say, okay, well, we don't have this, but it looks like you're inter interested in this area. So, um, you know, we can help refine things or, or steer you in directions of resources that are available. Um, and I think I'd also say that you don't necessarily have, even though of course we want to help you and we're here to help, but it's not always using our materials either. Um, you know, there are people who've written a lot of things using other archives around. Actually, Lily used a lot of local archives as well. Um, and that's also, I think, part of our role is if we know that other resources exist actually anywhere in the world, part of our job is to help you find those. Um, it's really about engaging in a humanities topic, doing humanities-based research and, you know, and hopefully finding a sort of love and inspiration in that. Um, in terms of how it works, um, again, we have the proposal part to the process because we realize it can be daunting, as Lily said, to do a big essay like this. And so when we see the proposals, it's really to help it's not to judge them <laughs> to say you know whether or not it's really to help make sure that you're on track and that we can help you either put you in the direction of resources that you might not know are there because you might want to mention a few things that you think you'll use but also maybe if we realize it's going to be just too overwhelming that we can maybe 
help discuss with you some of the aspects that you might then focus on within it to sort of help you narrow your thinking a little bit earlier on. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this, the proposal itself, I would say is also is not part of the judging process. So it's important, I think, that you do enough to show you've done groundwork and you've thought about it, maybe tried to do a little bit of searching on your own to see where you go, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and I would say, don't have the proposal be what stops you from participating. I mean, please just, if you want to do it, let us know and we will work it out. Um, don't, don't be intimidated by that. It's just to, to get you thinking. Um, in terms of resources, I was actually searching because in the past I've sort of, I, I know that somewhere I have this big list that I created that I probably should have turned into a lib guide, but I don't think I have yet. Um, that I did early in the pandemic of you know various databases that we have and what I'll have to do is I think share share a link to that later, um, but local databases that we have um, some of which are only you know at McGill so for instance we have a database that has the entire digitized library of the Royal College of Physicians of London. So you can imagine that if you're interested in military medicine or colonial medicine or early modern medicine anything that went through the Royal College of Physicians in London, which is a tremendous amount, we have access to that. We actually bought access. We have local, um, we also have access to, you know, newspapers from around the world. You can look at all sorts of kinds of local health practices, if it's in other countries, if it's, sometimes that's a way of getting into indigenous health questions, which is not a strength of ours for, I think, reasons that are, it's not, knowledge that you know we are holders of um, but there's still ways of using the resources sometimes to get into that um, and then also of course we have fairly significant digitized collections I'll put some some links in later to like our our internet archive which is mostly books maybe to our archival catalog which has a few digitized items um, but I would also say we can digitize on demand so if there's something that you know is going to be really helpful to you as long as it's not in copyright um, we can discuss with our digitization team whether or not it's feasible to digitize it. Um, that has to do with condition and things like that usually and, and what their timeline is like. Um, but I think really to say we are here, um, we have a tremendous amount of resources available to us locally, but also from around the world. Um, I guess I should also say given the move, um, you know, we are still officially closed. Uh, we've unpacked some of the last boxes last week. Um, we are focusing this summer on really getting the library in shape for reopening with the beginning of the academic year. We have fairly large sections. We have to make sure they're in the right order. We're actually bringing a bunch of sections together. I, you don't need to know that other than to realize that we actually have a lot of work to do behind the scenes. Um, so our our sort of open days might be a little bit limited when we have researchers and we try to, to bunch them up, but don't have that be a, um, again, don't be put off by that. Just, you know, communicate with me and I will definitely do my best to accommodate you um, and to invite you in for a discussion or we can have Zoom discussions as well about your topic. Um, I think that's just um, begging a little bit of um, forgiveness and patience if maybe sometimes it'll take me a couple of days to answer an email if I'm like, on my feet all day long or something like that but um you know we are here and and please you know nudge me as well if you need to so i will stop with that and maybe mary you can talk a little bit about the issue of having a mentor or um, you know an individual that will will help you uh, uh, during this process because i think that's also important oh yeah sorry um so part of what we do too and i think we'll be relying you know, partly again, because we're we're in the midst of moving on a, a slightly larger team of networked people, which is probably good for you all this year, is um, when we get the proposals, sometimes people already have a mentor that they know they want to work with. And I think it's good if you can start thinking about the kind of professor you might want to work with, or if you know someone already, you know, is it is it a music professor? Is it someone in anthropology or sociology or history or English? Um, and maybe do some searches on, on the McGill. It doesn't have to be a McGill person either. If you're somewhere else and you have a former professor that you really want to do a, something with, you can. Um, but we are also here to help with that. So again, if you don't have a mentor, we can look at your proposal, talk about it, and then think about who might be a good person to guide you through it. And actually, speaking of that, someone who can't be here today, but who is one of our curators um, and has 
mentored people in the past is Dr. Richard Fraser from the Maud Abbott Medical Museum, who's also a pathologist. Um, and he'd mentioned, for instance, that, um, and I'm just looking at some notes that he sent to me to share if someone's interested, um, that there was in 1928, there was a book of poems that was given to a 14 year old patient, a tuberculosis patient, um, um, tuberculosis of the spine actually specifically, and who was at the Shriners, of course, just up the road here. And I, I'm just seeing, I guess he was thinking that this was, this was something that could be the kernel of, or, you know, sort of the, this could be a jumping off point for a bigger, for, for an essay, both on the experience of that particular patient, but maybe also the experiences of maybe, you know, maybe a bigger, you know, looking at certain aspects of the history of the Shriners, or maybe looking at how, um, you know, younger patients with certain particular kinds of tuberculosis um, could be treated. But, you know, again, it's an idea that sometimes you can have one source and you can jump with it, but that is, that's sort of something that one of our frequent mentors already has sort of in the bag that if someone is interested to, to reach out for more information about. Um, and, and again, I would just say, if you're wondering about certain ideas or just vague areas, feel free to drop me an email. I'll also put that in the chat. Um, because I, I, you know, I might have some ideas of where you might go looking to do your initial explorations for for more information. I mean, we have, you know, some war letters, their diaries, photographic information. We have public health reports from Quebec and Montreal that have such an incredible wealth of information. It's it really is. Um, pretty much anything out there. Just this question of having the sort of the creativity and the knowledge to know how to get at it. So nobody's mentioned prize money. Whose job is that? <laughs> well, we can do that. The um, the initial, you know, the maybe we can talk a little bit before we do that, Mary. Maybe you can uh, sort of mention how how the you know how these essays are judged. I mean, I think that would be useful for people to know. Okay, so every fall, um, I bring together a committee of that's usually combined faculty members from usually, you know, places like history, social studies, medicine, or, you know, humanities-based uh, faculty, and also some of members of the board of curators at the library. Um, and so they are essentially our expert panel, and they, they read through the essays, and they have a scoring grid where each person will, will judge the essay. And so that's the per first part of it. And I will say, I read all of the essays, but I, and I'm, you know, there with the committee, but I don't judge any of them. And I don't have any, I don't make any comments that are judgment based at, at all. I stay out of it because I mean, for obvious reasons, I work fairly closely with some of the essayists and I just think it would be a conflict of interest for, for me to have any say at all <laughs> in who gets chosen. So I completely stay out of that. So the main part of it really is the written production, the essay that you is usually due in early October. Um, and we have it due in early October so that the judges do have time to go through everything and really, really think about it and meet to, to discuss them. And then on Osler Day, which is the first Wednesday in November, it's going to be the second of November this year, um, or sometime around Osler Day, you know, now that we've had the pandemic, we realize we can be a bit more flexible, is when the finalists and uh, usually, it, traditionally, it was just the three finalists would present their essays, and then we'd choose the order from based on that, and and on the quality of the essay itself. In recent years, I think we've been working to maybe move it off of Osler Day in order to have a little bit more time for the presentation, so we can actually invite all participants to present their work, um, and maybe some other people as well. Because I think that's an important part of it. Is also you essentially get a presentation out of it and. That's a different way of thinking about it than thinking about your essay, which is longer, to think about how you're going to express um, and share visually uh, what it is that you've been working on. But the judging itself has those two parts of, of a committee of experts who read the essays and judge each one and then discuss. Um, they, you know, they come together and really have very hearty discussions about the merits of each one. And then they do the same after the um, essay presentations as well to decide the, fi the, um, the final order. I think that gives us sort of background information as how, how this is sort of put together. 
related to the um, prizes, uh, the first prize is $1,000. Uh, second prize is uh, $500. And the third prize is $250. There have been some years where there have been ties. In other words, two individuals who have uh, both, uh, let's say, ranked number one. And, and then $1,000 was given to both of those particular individuals. So there, the money is one aspect of it. But I think the more interesting part about it is that if you, for example, are one of the less th three winners, um, there is a potential that you, you, if you wish, number one, um, uh, you can consider putting your essay, uh, an abstract from your essay into the American Ultra Society. Uh, and that uh, essay has to be uh, put in somewhere, sometime after uh, the November 1st or November 1st week in November sort of time period for the, uh, uh, essay, uh, essay uh, presentations, uh, and if your and if your particular essay uh, is is uh, accepted by the American Work Society, then um, there is a, an ability for uh, us to the the, the group, the both the uh, uh, the money that comes from the endowment and other monies for you to travel to or wherever that happens to be. Uh, to give you an idea, it's actually sort of interesting. It's very difficult to consider that you could go to um, uh, London, England for the, um, for the 2023, but if you were chosen, uh, uh, potentially uh, the American Orchestra Society would provide you with you know, a substantial amount of money too. So, you know, there is the ability to, uh, to uh, consider that. One of the problems with being away for a long time uh, is that's a little bit more difficult. And I think Saman and Lily can talk about this too. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually the vice president of the American Ultra Society this year. And next year, I'm actually the president. And I'm moving relatively quickly to uh, have the student presentations over a weekend. So you could arrive, for example, on a, on a Friday evening, have the presentation and do your presentations and your, your interactions with uh, uh, other individuals and other individuals who pr present uh, over the weekend and then be there for, let's say, the Monday morning or whatever, and you could leave the, in the afternoon. So then you only lose a very short, small amount of time, for example, on the clinic if you happen to be in third year or or there's some important thing that uh, has to be done uh, in that week that the American Ultra Society meeting is, uh, is going on. So that is moving forward also. And the other thing is, for example, if you can't, uh, or it's impossible to go to the American Ultra Society meeting in London, England, you have the ability to, uh, to present at the Kansas City meeting in 2024, if that's completely open to you also. So there's, there's an, we're, we're pretty flexible about the whole process. You also get to put on your CV. Yes, obviously it's a- Start um, to build it. From that point of view. And also, you know, uh, presenting at the American Horse Society, and maybe uh, Saman and Lily can speak about this a little bit because that's an experience in itself from that aspect of it. For sure, I'm just going to also add in addition to Pam and Rolando's comments, the first place winner also wins the medal. Uh, so there's a very nice, a very heavy medal with your name engraved in the back. Um, it's, it's very beautiful, so I'm just going to say that too. Uh, with regards to the experience of the conference, it is technically an international conference, people from North America presenting. Uh, there's a very wide range of uh, physicians uh, in, in different disciplines that are present there, and they've been there for quite some time. I mean, Lily and I, this was our first uh, time presenting at the conference. It was a great experience, uh, just uh, taking a break from medicine too. I think that's also very nice, and it's... Uh, it's a very productive use of your time too. So it's something that you can experience and especially people in the first and second years, I think it's gonna be much easier. Even people in third and fourth year, uh, Brendan has done it twice, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, if there's a will, there's a way. And uh, it is uh, something that you can really diversify. So with both the presentation and the essay and also the Osler uh, meeting. So those are three different things that you could potentially, if you're interested, based on your CV. So I think it's a really great opportunity to, to really take advantage of. I'll pass it on to Lily. Yeah, I, for me, it was definitely one of, I guess, if not the top, my favorite thing that I've done in Med One so far. 
like you you meet all these very inspiring people you get to talk to other med students other physicians and like it, it was a really amazing experience and the other thing is if you if you do present as a student and uh at the American Orchard Society, you're immediately a member, a student member of the American Orchard Society, and you get all the information from the American Orchard Society, which involves, uh, you know, there's newsletter information about the articles that are coming out by other members. Uh, there are poetry uh, sort of uh, uh, sessions that occur a couple times a year that you can be involved with if you if you're interested in, uh, in writing poetry. Uh, so there, you know, there's multiple things that, that go on uh, at the American War Society. And in fact, uh, if you're interested in art, there's there's art presentations, there's sculpture presentations and other types of presentations. I think Brendan had some art. Didn't Brendan have art there in the art display? I think he did. He may have. Yeah, I think he did. So, you know, there's all kinds of different different ways to sort of uh, enjoy uh, these types of international societies. So uh, they, they give you a different view of the uh, of the world, a uh, different view of how people think about, let's say, the humanities in different parts of uh, uh, the country. Uh, it's very common, from, for example, from individuals from South Africa to be there, Australia. And so, again, it pr provides you with a um, a diversity of ideas and thoughts that you don't necessarily always get uh, while you're in medical school. And sometimes that can be um, uplifting and also gives you opportunities to think about um, other, other options you may have related to, let's say, anything from your uh, postgraduate training, your fellowship training, et cetera. All those are, are possibilities that you, uh, that you get some knowledge about related to these, these sort of um, activities. So maybe if you agree, Brennan, uh, uh, Samad, maybe we can ask, um, uh, we can sort of see if people can uh, uh, have questions and then see what we can do to answer them. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, not to put any pressure on anyone, but if anyone has any questions about topics or really any aspect of this, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and do that. So we'll be happy to address it. Maybe I can take the lead here and... and, and... Hi, y'all. Oh, I actually, I don't have any questions. I, I had, but they were all answered over the course of, of your talking. I just wanted to say, you're making it sound very exciting and I am looking forward uh, to getting involved with this. Well, y'all, maybe what you can do is tell us what, what types of areas would you be interested in, for example, related? Uh, sure, so, so just a little um, introduction for myself. I just finished first year med at McGill. Um, and so I come from Guelph where I did a bachelor's of arts and science. Um, and so my arts was, or my science was genetics to keep me on the science field. And then my arts was classical studies. Um, and I really took a liking to Alexander the Great, um, his conquest of the world, his successors, the Ptolemies in their library of Alexandria and the museum, they had a lot of um, dissections kind of stuff going on. Um, so just off the top of my head, I mean, that's my favorite era of history. So that's what I'm thinking of trying to find something. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's generally the topic I'm thinking of right now. Since I, since I sort of love libraries, I think the whole idea of the, you know, the Library of Alexandria and, and how an uh, attempt was made in that library to, you know, have all the known knowledge of the world present in yeah. one library. And, uh, and for, you know, a number of centuries that, that was the goal. And also the destruction of the, uh, of the library and the loss to humanity of, of, of the knowledge that was present, or at least some of the knowledge that was present in it, I think is a, is a very interesting sort of area and it links to the, the importance of the maintenance of knowledge, you know, the, the transfer of knowledge from generation to generation. And that's what libraries sort of do, that, that's their role. Yeah, to 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 maintain sort of a, at least an aspect of 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 uh, the cultures and other activities of of uh, each individual sort of group that they're associated with. So, I think I think those those are very you know you can see how there's so many different things you can think about in that yeah. in that area. No question about that. Yeah, so, I was going to jump in too and just say I mean of course we have you know sort of classical traditions of, of you know, of Greek medicine and, and, you know, 
texts like you know the Loeb editions and things like that, of course, that are very famous. But you know, uh, as Dr. Del Mastro was mentioning, the transmission of knowledge up. I mean, one could sort of take certain authors or texts and say, you know, well, look at all the editions that we have over the centuries too, because you know maybe we have the modern critical editions uh, that are supposed to be as close as they can to classical editions but you know then we have you know which of our we've recently digitized uh, i think they've now finished if they they're not they're almost finishing digitizing all of our middle eastern languages manuscripts so to see how some of those even if you don't speak the languages the catalog records will let you know you know there's a little bit of you know hippocrates aphorisms that have been built into this particular arabic text or things like that and then see how they come back again and last in 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 um in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, we have all these, you know, early printings of mostly Latin texts, but of course, then you have the translations too into French and English. Um, um, but yes, we do also have the the, the critical editions. Um, you know, if one wants to work from, but there again, it's just a way of showing there's so many different ways of even looking at one question. If you're looking at it from the medicine from that time. Um, or if you're looking at how it's been transmitted and changed along the right. centuries. Yeah, that's that's something I hadn't even considered of thinking thinking of it that way, seeing how it was adopted by one culture, adapted and taken back. That's very interesting, actually. Alexandra, do you have any questions? Um, no, I don't currently have any um, specific questions. I'm kind of just thinking about what I'd like to maybe write um, about, and I'll just keep kind of working on on that and doing some research by, by myself like a little bit. What types of things are you interested in, Alexandra? Um, I personally really like um, dermatology and uh, anything linked to the diagnosis process on different types of like skin, like black skin or like different types of skin, which has uh, affected in, uh, in uh, the past um, diagnoses and stuff like that. So I'm maybe aiming more in that uh, direction, but still, you know, uh, staying open if I find uh, different subjects. Well, the whole area of dermatology and especially the fact that, you know, dermatology is a very, very visual, um, let's say specialty. You know, the idea is that you look at the skin, which is, you know, on the outside of the human body, uh, you generally don't cut into it very much as a dermatologist. You certainly do biopsies and things. But what's what's fascinating is the early books on dermatology are are very very uh, uh, sort of um, let's say beautiful from the point of view of adding various uh, types of uh, information to them uh, and the drawings that were done for them, the the coloration that is involved with them. So that whole area is, a, is quite a, a marvelous sort of area to be, uh, to be interested in. Uh, as soon as you open some of those, uh, those uh, volumes, uh, you see a whole new world uh, and, and everything from the actual uh, uh, drawings to the coloration, to the printing processes involved and how the book was put together related to the various types of, of diseases and how they were categorized that I don't think we've had anybody, Mary, I don't remember anybody looking at that area uh, in the past. And that would be a marvelous area if you were interested in looking at that. And I'm sure that there are a number of dermatologists who would be more than happy to help you with that one. Yeah, we do. Um, we have, I, I don't, not certainly not in my time, <laughs> which isn't that long. Um, has anyone looked at dermatology? But, you know, I know from having put a lot of elephant folios, which are huge books um, and others back on the shelf. We do have quite a few um, er, fairly early, like, you know, even certainly 19th, but probably some earlier dermatological atlases, which, um, you know, whether or not they end up being what you look at, you might want to come and just see them to gaze at, again, the way that they're printed, how they're depicting things. And, um, and that might be quite different from what you know today as well, and what diseases they actually were, were interested in. Thank you. That's that's really good to uh, to know. Thank you. Yeah, that whole the, the whole area of dermatology and its representation and how it's influenced other areas. Um, uh, 
you know, if you think about it, there's many different diseases that are involved you know, on the skin. Thermo, you know, uh, neurofibromatosis being one that involves the skin, but also involves multiple other organs. And, uh, and so there's, there's a whole sort of knowledge base of individuals that have, have gone and looked into these things. And then of course, it moves into the genetics too, how that's, that's occurred too. So uh, if you're interested, I'm sure that, uh, that Dr. Ural can find all kinds of interesting things for you to look at. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you can, you can uh, think about ways. I think the only suggestion I would have, both to anybody doing this type of work, is that one of the, one of the problems a little bit is to focus your, your talk and also your, your essay. And the reason for that is that um, most of these areas are very, very broad. And um, other individuals have also, most of the time, have written something about it, not all the time, but something about the area that you're interested in. And so the secret is, you know, uh, to try to find an area that you're interested in and then find some sub area within that area that excites you. And then if that's, if that's an area that, that uh, uh, you would like to be involved with, one of the advantages of that is then you can put that into, you take your essay and put it into sort of a manuscript. The manuscript, for example, can be submitted for publication. Brandon, for example, has done so and his manuscript associated with uh, uh, one of his presentations, the American Ultra Society is gonna be published next year. So, you know, again, you, you can see how you start with an essay with, with, you know, mentors and people that help you. Uh, and then what happens is if it gets to the point where it, 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 it has, it's, will actually increase the knowledge uh, base of the world in that particular area, it can be published and that goes on your curriculum vitae. And again, you know, what I, what I tell students all the time is, you know, people can take lots of things away from you, but they can never take an article that you've published and you put your effort into, that will be there to the end of time. And it's something that is sort of like, uh, you know, you can't necessarily, you know, pass on very much, but you can pass on that particular aspect of knowledge to the rest of humanity, which I think is part of the process of science in that aspect. Megan, your thoughts. Yeah, um, I actually have a, sorry. Um, I have a quick like question. I just wanted to confirm that we're not really like, in charge of connecting ourselves with a mentor, like, cause I'm coming from uh, MedP now. So I'm entering the faculty next semester. So I don't really have an extensive network of like uh, professors like that I know yet. So if I do submit a proposal, like I will be matched with someone. Yes, okay. So I don't have to do any of the looking and doing yeah. that. Yeah, right? it's okay. like, if you already know, or, you know, if done, that's great. But yeah, if, if we will definitely help you find someone. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, this is very interesting. Um, if I have to say what I'd be interested in, I have to think about it a little bit more. I think recently I've been um, really interested in um, medical assistance in dying. So maybe doing something about that, about um, kind of how physicians treat death and how we think about death and suffering and how we define um, suffering. And then, or I'm also thinking maybe um, something more like uh, gender related, maybe, which I'm also interested in. Um, I know I was reading a lot recently about how um, for years, like the scientific and medical establishment didn't really consider menstruation when uh, performing clinical studies or, or um, you know, te drug testing, which is a really big deal if you think about it, because women spend like a lot of their time um, menstruating. So maybe something about that or, um, yeah, and kind of how that intersects with uh, misogyny within the medical field. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very very large topic from that aspect. You know, there there is um, a fascinating aspect related to the dance of death, which is a whole sort of series of um, of images that have been really from the Middle Ages and onwards uh, to sort of see how death really affects all individuals. You know, and various art forms and have developed around this. That the death is the, is the equalizer. You know, it is in one way the equalizer of all individuals, whether you happen to be a king or you happen to be uh, uh, less than that, the, the death is, this, you know, in one way is the final and all that, that whole aspect of, of the process of each individual human. Um, and that, and it, it, has, um, it has obviously had various aspects of it that we don't deal with very much at that time. And people are looking more into how 
these aspects are, are occurring. But, you know, this is a, a, a very interesting topic and something as a physician, and certain, almost all physicians are going to have something to do with this. And the vast majority of physicians have something to do with death at some point in the training. That's just part of the process of being a physician. The concept of hospice and palliative care came out of McGill and not that long ago. Amazing. Really the first in Canada to, yeah. to recognize those words. And also the idea of, you know, uh, the first sort of uh, descriptions of how to deal with the, the dying patients, et cetera, came out, came out of McGill too, the first mm -hmm. handbook. So there's, again, a huge amount of information available there. And some of these individuals who are involved in this are still alive. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting Dr. Mounts. Yeah, yeah. Mounts yeah I was going to say, that is another aspect, is that depending on the topic, sometimes, you know, you can have even an, an oral history aspect of it or talk to someone who can help inform um, your research. You know, one, one of the individuals that I'm working with for another project, for example, is, is interested in Penfield and how he uh, uh, was involved in training uh, physicians. Well, there's a number of physicians who actually were still alive who were trained by him. So, you know, one, one can begin to actually, you know, talk about this in an oral way, you know, what, how did you feel? And I, you know, and I think Mary too, probably, you know, it's going to be important for the library in some way in the future to sort of, again, be involved in these, these ideas of oral histories, because when these individuals are no longer present, the only way we're going to know about them at all is, is because of what they've written or, or other aspects of what people say. But in one way, it's going to be interesting in the future to find out, if, you know, to actually get their feelings about how they did this or why they did that. And which may be a little bit different than has appeared in the literature, book, for example. Yeah. And, and collecting those is one thing, but I would mentioning oral histories reminded me that we have just, um, we're shortly going to make available, we have them now, which means anyone in this, anyone doing an essay could use them, is that the, I believe it was for their 50th anniversary, the uh, McGill Genetics Group um, did a whole series of, of oral histories of key players who were part of that sort of you know, cross within the sciences, cross disciplinary group um, that really contributed a lot. And so we have those available and they've also been translated. So we have the oral histories transcribed in English, but they've also been transcribed, I mean, translated into French to make them more accessible um, locally. And I should say too, in terms of, you know, materials we have, we do have, we have a lot of archival material. We do have the Penfield collection is hundreds <laughs> of boxes of material, which isn't just Penfield's professional work, but we have, you know, his, some of his diaries as well, letters with certain family members. So you sometimes get that personal aspect, but, you know, also his wife's letters and things like that. If you want to see things about relationships, um, we have a, a lot of archival material from people who've done important medical research at McGill, but, you know, also things like our, we have, we're, another strength of ours is in sort of anatomical texts or, you know, questions about dissection, anatomical atlases. So it's a lot of the visual material is very strong as well. Are there any other questions from uh, Megan or Yoel or Alexandra? So I think the other thing that uh, I'd, like, I'd like you to do if you're, if you're interested is to sort of uh, talk uh, to some of your friends who you think might also be interested in this. Because um, uh, from my perspective, one of the roles of uh, the essay contest is really to engage individuals with the Ulster Library and with the whole humanities aspect of medicine. And um, you know, the, the way to do this is to have groups of individuals who have a common goal. And the common goal is to make move forward the whole idea of humanities and medicine. And, you know, in one way, um, libraries sort of are an interface or a bridge between, you know, the humanities and medicine. That's what they do. They, they bridge those two together. And um, the more that the bigger the bridge is, the more people that can cross it, the better it is overall for everybody. No question about that. Saman, any other thoughts? Anything else we have to do? I, I can't think of anything else we have to do. The only other comment I have for the people that are planning to apply for the essay competition is to maybe carefully go through the list of the previous winners and just familiarize with the topics that have been written 
it gives you a sense about the scope of the projects. If you want to narrow things up, you want to widen them. There are also reflective pieces following the competition that you can also read, which gives you a sense of what it was like for different people with different experiences participating in this. And again, I, I left my email there. And you can more than you're, you're always welcome to send me an email if there's any questions. And uh, I think Arjun, our also co-president, is also here. So if Arjun, he's also been involved uh, for a number of years. If Arjun has any sure, uh, insights, suggestions, I think that would also be very valuable. Arjun, are, are you are you with us? Or are you still on the subway? Or there you are. Hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry, um, I just got home, and um, but I, I was I've been listening this whole time, and. Um, I think everything that's uh, needed to be said has been said. Uh, the only thing that I can add, perhaps, is uh, from a third-person perspective, um, me being the listeners and readers of the, all the essays that have been produced. Um, honestly, these are one of the best essays that uh, I've read. The students are absolutely creative with their topics to choose. Um, it's very thoughtful and very insightful. And I, I urge anyone who's interested in, in applying to apply and, and to see, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, it's no harm done. Like try, try and see what you like and you get to learn more about the topic that you enjoy. You have uh, teachers teaching you and it's just all around an amazing process. And we have amazing tutors. Uh, we have amazing support from like Dr. Hurl and, and so on and so forth. So honestly, um, apply, that, that's my only advice. <laughs> I should also jump in mentioning the reflective pace makes me realize I kind of forgot to mention that earlier as part of um, the uh, contest process. That's another part that's not that we see as being very important, but that's not graded. It doesn't count into who wins, but you know, you know, we think it's as, we, as you come to the end and you've put your essay in, you do a submit it at the same time, a short reflective piece sort of on you know, the, maybe the process, what you've learned, things that surprised you. It Again, there's a lot of flexibility and variability in terms of what you decide to bring out of it, but it's supposed to be your own sort of personal response um, to the process of going through the essay contest. Um, and we, yeah, you can read past reflective pieces online. And if you go to previous sort of a few years back, it hasn't happened as much with more recent winners, partly because of so, so much, so many of our recent finalists have, um, been looking to publish their pieces fairly quickly. And so therefore we haven't published the essays usually online. Once people do publish them, we, we really hope to have links so that we can link to the published essay. But if you look back in previous years, some of the earlier years, you can see some of the essays that were um, submitted when people allow us to put those on, which we're also very happy to do. If you have something where you don't necessarily want to submit it for publication, you can either submit it for us. We have a newsletter at the library that comes out a couple of times a year. Um, we're really happy to, and it doesn't have to be an essay. You know, Even if you don't finish the essay contest, if you did something where maybe you have a shorter piece and you think you'd like to present that, um, we're happy to do that. Um, and there, there are other places as well. But yeah, the reflective piece is another part of it that I think for, for you personally is is a good opportunity to reflect on how it's gone and what surprised you and how meaningful it's been, we hope. Um, but it's really, we want it to be a positive experience um, and, and you know, just something that gives you another kind of, of meaning um, in your journey through medical school. I guess on that note too, because I'm just about to submit my manuscript, if you'd like to directly reach out to me, I'm happy to also share my essay if it helps. It's on the website, but. I'm happy to share that if, if it is of any use to any of the participants. So you're more than welcome to do that as well. Any other questions? So I think as far as Pam and I are concerned, we, we encourage you and any of your friends who you may know who have uh, uh, you know interest in these areas also to, uh, to participate. This year is a little bit new in the sense that pre-med students can, can be involved in it uh, this year and also uh, students who have been accepted into McGill Medical School. So um, it's a, a, another group of individuals are, um, have, uh, are allowed, well, let's say not allowed, but at least are encouraged to be involved in the, in the process. Let me put it that way from that aspect. And we hope that more and more 
pre-med students will, will be involved in this and more and more individuals who have been accepted in McGill Medical School but are not actually in first or second or third year uh, can also be involved over the summer to do their predictive project. That just expands the whole scope of, of uh, individuals and uh, getting them when they're earlier in their, their career and then maybe have a little bit more time to do these types of things too. Okay, well, I, I think from, from Pam and I's uh, perspective, uh, thanks everyone for being on the- On, the, on a Friday. Uh, on a Friday uh, at four o'clock. And, uh, and we wish you all the best for the weekend. And thank you very much for, uh, to Saman and Lily uh, and uh, Arjan, and also to Dr. Earl for, uh, for taking the time to be involved with this. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, have a great weekend. And I hope that this can, uh, this little session has uh, stimulated you a little bit. And, and thanks again, Lily and, and Saman for, uh, for all your insights and how it feels to, to be associated with, uh, with this whole process. And the American Orchard Society from that point of view, from that, that issue. And I think the other thing to think about is there is, an, a, there is an Ulster, a medical student Ulster Society. So uh, Megan, for example, that might be something you might be interested in, uh, in being involved with and the other individuals uh, if you're not already involved in the um, uh, Gill Medical uh, Student Ultra Society, uh, maybe if Samantha, you can give them two or two, a couple minutes on that, just because I think that's an important aspect of it too. For sure, well, thank you. I'm just going to also credit Arch for the past two years. He's been the co-president and he's been a tremendous force in the organization. Uh, he will be on the advisory board for next year. Uh, I will be uh, the co-president senior and, uh, and the mission of the Ozer Society as you can tell partly is ESA competition. Uh, we have a number of events that we're hosting, a number of events that are already planned for next semester. And we will be recruiting uh, preferably people from MedP and Med1 going to Med2. So uh, younger blood people with more time. So there will also be an application that will be available to you. And uh, you can uh, directly send it to the MPL Society. Uh, I don't have access to it, but I can also put an email in the chat or if Arjun could do it. And again, the goal is to engage students with different dimensions. There's a podcast that I'll let Arjun talk about. He's been spearheading that. Uh, we will also have a website that we've been sort of negotiating and having a, an archival source of the previous events that we posted and also uh, like an established community, given that this is the oldest student society at the university. So, uh, something to think about and something for you to consider getting involved with. Uh, we will also have the applications open up soon. So if questions, you can directly reach out to myself or Arjun. We'll be happy to address it. Arjun. Yes, exactly. So uh, just a little bit briefly touch upon the podcast. So um, thus far, we've worked on a podcast series where we have um, three episodes created for uh, based on um, the Aboriginal health. And it's actually something that we well, um pitched it to Miguel UGME and has been included into the curriculum actually, into the, the putting it all together curriculum part of Med4. So it's something that we plan to keep producing more uh, as, um, you know, different topics. So if you guys are interested, obviously like um, you can get involved. There's honestly, there's uh, being part of the committee, uh, being part of also society also comes with a lot of, you know, freedom to kind of explore all the things that you want to. And, you know, this essay is one thing that, that, shows that that we want you to be thinking about other things than, gen, than just medicine. Um, so honestly, like there, to keep an eye out for things that are coming out, it's gonna be a lot of interesting topics um, that as, as someone had mentioned. Um, as also like, if you have any questions, obviously like come feel free to like contact me through either the email, the uh, Miguel Alter Society email or on Facebook if you can find me and I'll be happy to help you, honestly. Is there anything else someone that I missed? Comprehensive as always. Again, uh, I'm just trying to uh, type in and give you the email address so you can reach out. And also, there's a Facebook page. Uh, I think uh, some of you have already liked it, so you will you will find the updates for the position both on the Facebook page and also on the groups. So so that's something that's probably going to happen as soon as I'm done with my exams. We're going to have a conversation with Arjun and also have this available. We're not part of the MSS, but we work with the MSS. So that's the other thing. And I think I think that's pretty much everything. And the recording will also be made available later, I guess, for people that are watching this later on. Hello. And so if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. And we hope that you all participate. And uh, if, the, if there needs to be any more questions of any kind, uh, feel free to reach out. We're always happy to help. I think that should be everything for my end.
Thanks, everyone. Pam and I uh, wish you all the best for the weekend and uh, all the best uh, uh, in next year medical school for people who are already in medical school and uh, for people that are coming into medical school, all the best in your first year. All the best. Take care now. Bye bye now. Just a lot of thank yous.